Hello, hello, hello. My, am I excited today. But I know, I say that every week. And we've got a couple of people that are already commenting. Nancy Brennan, thank you. And let me pull up my guest, Miss Val Burgess. How are you today? I am great. Thank you for having me. I am so elated that you are here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share your bio. And then the video is not on the platform yet. So while you're sharing a little bit about yourself and what you're doing, I'll pull that up and we'll air that as well. But in the meantime, let's tell the audience a little bit about who is Val Burgess. <laughs> well, first of all, as a middle-aged woman with two children, an amazing husband, a remarkable life and a thriving business, an opportunity opened up for her to travel to Europe with former World War II prisoners of war for the 50th anniversary of their liberation. For her marketing expertise, it was a free trip. In April of 1985, and as a group of 125 prisoners of war and 200 members of their families, she and they traveled to Saglag Luff, Saglog Luff Long U. <laughs> you can Stalag tell me more about Luf, Stalag uh, Luf 3. <laughs> okay, all right. You can tell me more about that after I finish. The Great Escape Camp of World War II fame followed their forced march and ended up 50 years to the day at Moosburg, Germany, and Saglog. 5A, a camp where they were liberated in April 27, 1945. This was a life-changing event as these people were over the years taught her how to live her best life. Through hundreds of oral histories and a vast archive, these stories are now seeing the light of day so that you too can learn from them. There is importance in learning from someone that experienced extreme tragedy. It gives you the understanding that you can change your outlook on the difficulties you've experienced as daily they suffered for us, our children and our nation's future. They taught how to overcome your fears and view your adversity from a different perspective, thus allowing you to see how it formed you and can make you a better person. They showed the resilience and courage and how to forgive unconditionally and against all odds. This work has allowed her to speak across the country and in schools and to incarcerated youth in her home state. Following her 30 year stint as a commercial artist and owning her own business, her research allowed her to be a World War II historian, archivist, educator, and speaker. And I am honored to have you here with me today. I'm before so I, before I bring you on to share more of your journey, we have some guests that are 
here. And I want to acknowledge Nancy. She says hello and good evening. And she says, hi, Val. Thank you for watching. Please share because this is going to be a very important show. And it's going to help us all recognize what resilience means, what True. overcoming means. But in the meantime, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to give you the floor. And I want you to just share with our audience your journey. And let's talk about, I mean, you can start from childhood all the way up. Okay. And just share your journey and, and how you became so enamored with these World War II survivors? Well, you know, I always knew that I had something important to do. I just, I believe that in my whole heart. And I just was always looking for it. And one day we were at my grandmother's wake and my uncle said that he wanted to go back to the prison camp in 1995 with um, a large group to celebrate the 50th anniversary of their liberation. And he, he didn't say with a large group, he just said he wanted to go back. And I finally got tired of listening to him. And I said, well, why don't you just go back? And he said, well, I want someone to do the, to market it so that I can, I can take a large group back. And I volunteered. And he said, you have a free trip to Europe. Well, I will never turn down a free trip to Europe. So it was really selfishly that I got into it. But then we sent out 3000 letters and these people started calling me about the trip. And I was sharing things with them. And almost every one of them left a story. And it was just like, wow. I, you know, I'd never really been interested in World War II. I was, you know, a 54 brat. And I just, uh, I, I was so surprised that I just really fell in love with them. And on that trip started doing massive oral histories on men on the buses. There was 125 POWs and 200 members of their family. And Nancy Brennan actually is a friend. Her dad was one of the POWs that I just dearly loved. He was just such a wonderful human being and such a kind and great man. And he ended up being a prisoner as well. And But he was the kind of gentleman that just loved people. He loved young, old, you know, you name it. He was just a wonderful guy. His, his airplane was called Miss Irish. Oh, my. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, so in looking at you going through this process what were some of the most significant mm -hmm. things that you took away from these veterans and i we got a lot to talk about right <laughs> and i'm just starting with this so tell us a little bit about that well i didn't really have much direction as a child um i was the oldest and i was always heard oh just go do it you know you can do it just go do it because my brother was, was sickly and he went deaf for a year. And so it, it was just my, my job to just go do it. So I did, I got involved in all kinds of things. And then I made my mother have to get involved a little bit. And it was, it was really, really important to me. And when I started hearing their stories, it was like, I need to tell these stories because they shared with me things in their oral history. I don't think they were trying to teach me, but certainly they did so that I could have a better life. And I will be forever grateful for them for, for doing that for me. And so I started in 1993, no, I guess it was 1994. And I did two oral histories, one of a man who was, um, he was Mr. Um, Mr. Security in Stalag Luf 3, which meant there was Mr. X because they were always trying to escape. It was the British, it was their deal. They were really warranted. They were really required to try and escape. And so uh, General Clark, he was Colonel Clark at the time, got involved. And so did a lot of other POWs. And they were doing clandestine work. They were making clothing. They were writing, making fake pass or, uh, passports and, and different documents. And they created what was called the Great Escape Tunnel, which was a tunnel that was um, 30 foot deep, 400 foot long, and it was a two by two uh, tunnel. And and actually every inch of that tunnel had to be shored up with boards because it collapsed. And so that's where, you know, and, and I loved that movie as a child. I don't know if you're, any of you remember, but Steve McQueen rides off 
on a motorcycle and then they capture him. I don't remember if they killed him, but you know, it was the story of the great escape and another show. Um, Oh, what, what is it? Uh, Hogan's heroes was also, yeah. um, it was also the, the advisors on that show were world war two prisoners of war at Stalag Lu three, the great escape camp. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And so the, the funny, you know, it wasn't funny like that. I mean, although they did pull some things, like, for instance, um, the, the Americans weren't in the prison camp at this time because they didn't start coming in until 1942, after July of 1942. And there was a German general who had just bought a brand new sports car in Berlin. And the prison camp was about 90 miles um, northeast of Berlin. And so he drives in with his fancy sports car and he says to the commandant, I want to go in and I want to talk to the prisoners about war. And I'm going to take my sports car and show German ingenuity. And the commandant who's, you know, he's the officer in charge of the camp says, well, sir, I, I don't think I would do that. Nonsense. And he goes in, he goes in to have tea with the highest ranking British officer. His name was Wings Day. <laughs> And he comes out and his car has been stripped, tires, the steering wow. wheel, everything. And he was just so irate. He goes into the commandant and the commandant finally goes to Wings Day and he says, you don't have to return any of the products that you're, you know, any of the pieces of the car that you took. But what you have to return is the briefcase that was sitting on the passenger side seat. So Wings Day calls his men together and they bring him the suit, the briefcase, and he opens it up. He has someone translate every one of the documents. And at the bottom of it, there was a stamp that said, you know, anyone who reads this has to sign your name, your rank, your branch of service and the date. So Wings Day had every one of them read to him. He signs Wings Day, um, British Air Commander. I'm not sure that's exactly what they called it. And then he signs the, the date. And um, the general was never seen again. What? Mm -hmm. Because he he should not have gone into he should not he should not have had classified documents and allowed the allies to do it because they were actually they had radios and they would actually listen to BBC every night, and so I mean they it was really a cat and mouse game until um, 1940 or 40 19. 45 when it became really when the, the great escape occurred in um, March, March or April of 1944. And, you know, 70 men got out and 50 men were murdered by the, the, the Gestapo. And so a lot of those men, only three made it home. There was a Dutchman and two, um, two, well, they were from, oh, they weren't from Sweden. I think they were from Norway. At any rate, um, they, those were the only two that got home and there were no Americans that escaped. And if they had, they would have been murdered because they couldn't have spoken the language. They couldn't have, you know, they, the, all of them that were Europeans and, and even those that were Commonwealth, like from, you know, from New Zealand and from Australia, they knew how to ride trains in Europe because they, they go to Europe, but the Americans would not have, have done well. And they were moved into their own compound because there were so many Americans in the camp at that time. There was like 5,000 American POWs that came into the camp in July of 44. And during the, the summer months, there was just a lot of men shot down. And by shot down, I mean, they were shot down out of their plane. They had to bail out. They had to, um, you know, and, and many of them were hurt bailing out because our government said to them, why practice something you must know perfectly the first time, which means bailing out <laughs> with a parachute that they had never used before. And at 28,000 feet or 20, 22, 20, you know, they were high in the sky and they couldn't, they couldn't really open the chute until they got to 10,000 feet because there was no oxygen above 10,000 feet. So they would count one, 1,000, two, because they were falling about a thousand feet a second. And, and then they, yeah. And it was, it was tough on them. Some men lost the ability to have children because they didn't have their straps on tight. And, you know, when that chute opens, it it's a strong pull and it, it was, it was not easy for them, but they did it. <laughs> Can you, you know, 
<laughs> the thing is, one, I'm not a history buff. Okay. Um, I began to appreciate history in college during middle school and high school. I hated it because it was so boring. But you make it come alive. <laughs> and you. and and that's important in order to understand our history and what have you. And so when you went on this tour with these guys and you said there were 125 POWs yes and 200 members of their family we had six buses of people now were these um POWs of all um races and all races yes but they were all POWs from Stalag Luft 3 the great escape camp because yeah. that's that's really the focus of where we wanted you to go. My uncle was there. I never even knew he was in the service. And I never even thought about it because I didn't like history. Why would I want to do that? You know, <laughs> and all of a sudden here I am. My friends get so tired because, oh, would you quit talking about World War II? <laughs> but Nancy, I could talk to Nancy for hours and we could both just have fun sharing because she loves World War II as well. We go to the same um, World War II reunions. It's called the 100th Bomb Group. And can I tell a quick story? Sure you can. The 100th Bomb Group is going to be featured in an eight or nine video series called Masters of the Air. It was developed by Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, and it will be out January 26th on Apple TV. And the cool part about it is that Nancy's dad will be one of those people that they talk to. And and a man who lives in he lived in Wyoming, in my town, he will be one of the stars. His name was Gail Clevin, and he died in my town. And so it's just so interesting that there's all these people like Dewey Christopher. You don't know him. You won't know him. But he was the coolest man. I Just people that I loved. Um, you know, it was... I can't tell you why I just cared about them so much, but I couldn't get enough of them. And they would share things with me that just sometimes took my breath away. Like when we were traveling in Berlin, this um, tour guide is, is giving us this little lecture on this, this, this beautiful lamp post. And, and, you know, it had several lights on it and it was given to the German government and, and the people of Germany by some country. And a man leans over to me um, across the aisle of the bus. And he said, you should have seen the American pilots hung by piano wire from oh. that. And it would just it, it just kind of startled you and almost took your breath away. And then you'd say, tell me more. So he obviously was there and saw that. And the roads were, were you know, blown to pieces. And, you know, they were trying to get him in a, somewhere so they could take him to a, on a train to the prison camp. And so everything was bombed. They'd have to move back. And the, the, the public would throw rocks at them and try to kill them, really. Sometimes they were pitchforked because they had bombed their country and... I mean, I probably would be mad if somebody bombed my house and took it out, but they did change things. And, and you know, I've read a lot lately about World War One and how really World War Two was just an extension. Our president um, at the time, he he came up with these ideas that there would never be another war, and he was really, really involved with it. And so at the Versailles Treaty, he was trying to get people to listen to him. And they only took one of the, the ideas and really didn't use it. They really more or less used it against the Germans. And the Germans, even though it was the Austro-Hungarians who started World War I, the, the Germans were found guilty of everything about World War I. And they had to pay reparations. They couldn't eat. They didn't have money to eat. They made you know, million dollar Reich marks so that they could, they just print it so people could buy something. And so it was a very hard time for the people in, in world during, after, during and after, but certainly the, the, uh, the military personnel who were Germans and in world war one, they were never to wear their uniform because people would, because it was their fault that they were in such bad straits worldwide. Wow. That is amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I'm having some technical difficulties with my um, trying to get, like right now, I'm trying to get back to you so that we can talk together. And um, okay, oh, here we you. are. I can see you. <laughs> now I could. Yes, I'm here now. And I'm telling you, this is, this is exciting to hear, but it's only exciting because 
of your delivery. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, heavens. And so, you know, go ahead. Well, I just was going to tell you a story about um, a man. He went down in um, October of 1943. And there was, it was called Black Week. So there was like four missions. And he was the last day of those four missions. And they lost 60 B-17s. Now that means 600 men went down. I don't know how many were killed. The day before, they lost 50 planes. So there were 500 men that went down. So in two days, they lost 1,100 men. And can you imagine the people that, that made it back to base? And when one someone disappeared, you know, if they were, they didn't know if they were dead or alive, but when they disappeared out of the unit over the the uh, the bombing, you know, the the target, they they took all their stuff and got it out of the barracks. So it was like no one ever lived there. And these men would go back and there'd be three of them in this barracks where there were 18 or something like that. And it was just horrific for them because those were their friends. I mean, combat makes you closer than brothers and sisters because you rely on each other to do the right thing, to get you home. And, and uh, Nancy's dad, he had a great pilot. Oh my gosh. I can't tell you the name. Mar Nancy, tell me what his name. I can see his face, but I can't think of his name right now. But you know, he did, he did way more missions than he had to. He probably had to do 25 or 35 and he did way, way more. And, uh, Bud, he, he, he talked to, Bud talked about when I interviewed him, he said that on D-Day, the English channel was so full of, uh, submarines and, and any kind of watercraft, you know, landing, uh, landing craft and, and ships. He said that you could have gotten out of an airplane and gone and walked from, um, to, uh, to ship, to ship, to ship all the way over to the, to, uh, wow. Ah, yeah. It, 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 you know, it's just interesting and it makes you want to learn more when they tell you the story because they were there. They saw yes. it. Their history. And you know, when I taught in some schools in my state, I, I tell the stories like I am today. And a number of women came up to me, young women who said, I never wanted to know about World War II, but you tell the personal side. I mean, I can give you dates sometimes, you know, I'm not, I'm not infatuated with the dates. I just, I'm just not infatuated with them. But anyway, it's interesting. Wow. Well, and you know what, speaking of that, that's interesting because my history teacher in college, he was the same way. He was like, it's not about the dates. It's about the events. Yes. <laughs> And so, and I think that's why it was so exciting. I did not open my history book the whole semester because he was so animated and so alive and so expressive. And I got an A in the class without opening right. the book. <laughs> just from, and you are the same way. I mean, this is exciting. Thank and you. so um, actually, she did put in the name, but I am really having a problem with my um, trying to click on my comments. Okay, let's see if that's going to work now. It's not. It's taking me out of it. Well, anyway, you know what? I think what I'm going to do is try to do a commercial. Okay. And then come back and see what. Well, actually, instead of doing the commercial, I'm going to play your video. Okay. So let me do that. All right. What would you say no, it doesn't if I said, up. come on now. No, I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I can see but, it. But it's not showing, we're not seeing it on the screen here. Oh. So let's see what's going on. Well, maybe we need to go down and let's see. Let me pull. Because you said you see it. Like I see it now. Oh, no, I don't. What would you say if I said the greatest generation, those that lived through the war, World War II, and that also survived the largest economic downturn in the world, the Great Depression, 
First, they survived the Great Depression, and then, without their help, without their starting it, they were forced to serve in World War II. I've always believed... Let me introduce you to Chapridge. It's a revolutionary new... Let me introduce you to Chapridge. It's a revolutionary new solution for getting great results from your online networking. Today, online networking has become the standard for millions of professionals. However, getting results from your meetings can be a daunting task. But now that challenge has been solved. Everyone knows how hard virtual meeting follow-up is. You go to an online meeting where at the end, people say save the chat to follow up. And now you have a nearly unusable and ugly chat text file to work with. You can now say goodbye to the hassles of downloaded Zoom type chat records. For the first time, with the introduction of this new ChatBridge tool, you have a simple system to easily import, search, review, follow up and find opportunities with the people you meet in all of your virtual networking meetings. And we also made it easy to archive all of your chat files and information on the people you met networking for future use. And it doesn't stop there. With Chapridge, when you select people to follow up with, you can view their exact posts and even click into their website, LinkedIn profile or Facebook page if they shared it. Then you can import your selected contacts into the powerful EngagePro system or export your contacts to your CRM, email tool, or autoresponder. Following up and getting great results from online networking is now easy and just a click away. Experience the power of the new chat bridge and you'll quickly see how to find new clients, get more referrals, speaking opportunities, and JV partners. There's nothing like it. Find out now how economical and easy it is to get the results you want from online networking at chatbridgeconnect.com. Nancy Brennan, she shared with me um, her father's pilot. Let me go in and his name was John Gibbons and he was a character too. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I, I guess I'm, I'm going to tell a story about some men you know, we know about the Bataan Death March, where the battling bastards of Bataan were captured by the Japanese and they were forced marched, oh, 60 some miles north in terrible conditions. Many of them died on the way. Many of them were beheaded. It was really um, one of the most, the most um, horrendous activities that occurred during World War II. And people always think of that. But in the European, in the European theater, there were forced marches as well. And in 1995, in January of 1995, towards the end of the month, Hitler did not want the Americans or any of the allied POWs, especially the airmen, to get back into the war zone. And so he said, let I'm on or not. Oh, there I am. And so they forced marched thousands upon thousands there was a prison camp called stalag luf 4 stalag meaning prison luf mean the luftwaffe of the german air Force. to 600 miles they go west they go a little back east and they go west again. They had no water, so they drank out of filthy ditches along the roadside, which really made them sick. They drank bark or they ate bark and leaves because they were so hungry. And if there was a farmer's field and there was frozen vegetables, that was their meal. And so these men, and there were, oh my gosh, there were 10,000 of them. 
that walked out of Stalag Lu uh, three, 6,000 that walked out of Stalag Lu four. And there were all kinds of other camps with uh, ground troops and other airmen that were force marched west. And some of them just laid down and die. Some of the strongest men there, like a, a, a football player who was a world renowned football player, not soccer, but a football player. He was an American and he just laid down and died. And, you know, they're lost to history. That's uh, very sad to me. I am so sorry. We are having technical difficulties here. It's okay. I, I just kept talking. I didn't know if I was on or not. So I kept right. talking. <laughs> I know. And the thing is, we have, I mean, we even got shut out altogether. Oh. Um, so oh. you may, <laughs> now I need to repeat everything you said. Well, I'll, I'll tell a different story. How's that? Okay. All I'll, right. I'll remember what I said. So Jack Katmeyer went down with the 60 airplanes that went down that day when 600 men were shot down. And he immediately was captured by the home guard and they put him in a ditch with his hands behind his back. And there were 10 men lined up to shoot him and kill him. They were going to execute him. And all he could think about was he wanted to make his dad proud. He didn't want to embarrass his father, even though his father would never know how he was killed. He was not going to cry. He was not going to show his weakness. He was going to show his strength. And all of a sudden, across the road, a farmer started yelling at these home guard. And they turned around and they they put their they 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 placed their ire towards that that farmer. And they marched him down the road, three of them at gunpoint. And they were they no longer decided they would kill Jack. So that that farmer who was a German farmer who probably I, I don't know what he said, we none of us do, but in the field with him was a little boy about seven or eight years old, and he had a team of oxen, and the little boy is just standing there crying. And none of us know what happened to them. It would be so wonderful if I could find him, you know, and know what what happened was I think he was probably with his grandpa or his father. I don't know how old he was. Um, but Jack really appreciated him. And then he was taken to a, a jail in a town and they, 
he, he had a, a soldier who was really injured badly and he needed some sulfa powder to get on his wound so that he didn't get an infection. And he asked the pilot, the, the Luftwaffe pilot who was in charge, can I go to my parachute and get some powder, some sulfur powder to put on this man's wounds? And he took him. And as they went in, wherever, he, wherever they were storing these, uh, you know, Jack's uh, parachute and all the other things he has code and all of that, they, um, they started talking about how nice it would be if they could be friends and how sad it was that the world was in a place where there was hatred and, and death everywhere. And Jack said, well, let me give you my address. And he goes, no, 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 no. If you were to give me that address, I could be killed if they, if they found it on me because you couldn't have an American. So he couldn't, he couldn't make friends with that. I mean, he did, but he didn't, if that makes sense, but he yeah. couldn't converse with him after the war. And Jack said to me, he said, to, <laughs> he's so funny. He said to me, I was never going to be hungry again. And he was hungry. And so he, he, um, when he died, I knew his executor because I, I inherited his standard poodle and all of his books. So I went out to Iowa and got them. And <laughs> Um, his executor called me, he goes, Val, I found a thousand pounds of food in the basement. So Jack was never going to be hungry again. He said it. He did. He, he said it. He did. But he also said, you couldn't pay me a million dollars to take that experience away from me, nor to pay me a million dollars to do it again. Because he was, there was no way he was going to do that again. But he was just, he, he loved kids and they never, he and his wife never had them. But he had all these young men that would take him to the VA because it was too far for his wife to drive. And he made friends with them as his coach, as his principal. He, you know, he kind of grabbed them by the ear and say, hey, don't be doing that. And, you know, he was a little rougher probably than we could do today. But, but, but they respected him because he expected that of them. And uh, what a great guy. I miss him a lot. He would tell me, I, one day I said, so... How did you urinate or defecate on the plane? <laughs> and so he tells me about a pee tube and they have had to pee in this tube. But when they got to above, you know, 10,000 feet, it was freezing. So it froze up. So he couldn't use it anyway. And one day he had to do number two. So he found a piece of paper and he used that and he dropped it out and it hit. The ball turret is, is a, is a ball, uh, plexiglass ball that's on the bottom of the plane, and it rotates around so it can fire machine guns on people. It hit right in the sight of the ball turret gunner, and he was so mad at Jack because he could have lost his life. You know, it could have been a really bad mission, and he couldn't fire because he couldn't see, so he was really upset with Jack, but it was, it was okay. So I've been really fortunate to learn both the Pacific and the European theater. So I would like to tell you a story about a man from the Pacific theater. His name was, oh my gosh, his name was, um, I can't think of it. I got I'll think of it in just a second. He was with the coastal artillery and he ended up on the Bataan death march, although he didn't have to walk as far because someone stole his shoes and he couldn't find them in the morning because they were in a, a, a corral and, and all of them were just laying on the ground. And so he's looking for his shoes. And some of the guys that were in his unit, which was the 200th coastal artillery Corps, they, they started helping him find them and they did. But by then all the guys had marched out and they were afraid the Japanese would beat them or do something terrible to them because they didn't leave with all the rest. Well, instead a truck came and picked him up and they put him in the back of this truck and the rest of the baton march, they got to ride in a truck. So he's taken to, um, to several camps and he gets a disease called, um, oh, anyway, it's a disease that your throat closes and you really, you die from it. And I think it's diphtheria. And so he, he was in, they took all of the men that got this diphtheria mm -hmm. and they put them in the, the X ward, which just meant you're never the XX ward. You'll never get out of there. So they expected you to die. And lo and behold, all of the men that were in that camp, there were five that sur survived. And so no one in the camp, none of the other prisoners wanted to be near them because they didn't want to get the diphtheria. And Jap got the diphtheria because he was on they, they, they carried a deceased POW on a mat and four guys, a guy at each corner, and they had the their hand 
I'm trying to show you and I'm going the wrong way. They had their hand on this, this mat and they would carry him up in the air. And Jack had to go over this, this ditch and he told them, but they stopped and he fell and the dead man landed face to face on top of him. And two days later, he came down with diphtheria. But the beauty of it, he always was able to find the beauty of it because he survived. And the fleas and the lice and the bed bugs wanted nothing to do with the men who had diphtheria. I don't know what it was, what body changes they were, but they never bothered them at all. And the Japanese PO, or uh, Japanese soldiers put them in a different place so the five of them could help each other heal. I don't think they were trying to keep them so they could heal. I think they just put them separate from the rest because none of the POWs wanted to be around them. And he was the kind of guy that always had a cup half full. So he's taken on a hell ship. And I don't know if any of you saw the um, uh, Louis Zamperini show uh, movie. It was uh, Unbroken. It was quite a movie. Anyway, Louis Zamperini was in a prison camp and he comes in the movie. He comes down this tra this uh, walkway out of a, a ship. And that hell sh that was a hell ship. And really hell ships. There was no food, no water. They were 300, 500, 700 in a hold of a ship. They didn't get they couldn't go. They had to urinate in their clothing. They had to. I mean, it was a mess and people got so bad that they started eating each other when some of them died. It was, it was really, I mean, this is, this is, this is the worst of the worst. So anyway, um, he ends up, Leonard Robinson ends up in Japan and uh, not Yokoichi, that's another one. Anyway, so he is on the docks and he is, they're taking uh, pig iron and they have coolies who bring this card in and they take their take the iron out and set it on the ground. And then a, a rail car comes in and then they put it in the rail car. Well, he took efficiency in college and he said he talked this woman into letting him take the the uh, pig iron out of the cart into the rail car. So she was making more money. And so all the other coolies wanted to wake, make more money. So they started doing it. And then the the uh, the soldiers the japanese soldiers were awarded because these men were doing such a good job and getting more done and so they they got them extra uh beans so that they could have extra soup every day and the men didn't want them to know how good they felt because they didn't want them to then you know force them to work really really hard so they just pretended that they could you know easily and sort of not, not lazily, but certainly not too much because they really didn't want them to, to know. And so one day that he got up and he went out to go to work and the guard said, the war is over. And he, he looked around and he, that night when he went to bed, he actually slept a whole night. He couldn't believe that the war was over with. And I don't know how many days it was, but days later they put him on a train and a lot of them on the train and they shipped them through Tokyo. And he said it was a city. There was nothing left of it. There was paper blowing everywhere and everything was destroyed. And he decided that day when he got to Tokyo that he would forgive his captives unconditionally. And he did. He told me he, he could Let's heal. Let's talk anyone. about that for a minute. Okay. Let's talk so, about forgiveness because. Okay. Well, because go ahead. <laughs> well, well, he said to me, I can tell anyone how to heal. He said, you have to turn your life over to a higher power. It could be Jesus, Buddha, whatever, but turn your life over to a higher power. And then you become comfortable with your story. Not all the gory details. You don't need to share all of those gory details. Those are yours. But he said, be comfortable with it so you can tell it and people know what happened. And he said, and then forgive unconditionally, not for them, but for you. And he yes. was, he was, he did it so well that he was actually taken to, oh, not Rhode Island, but I think it was Maryland. And they had him in a study to find out how he could so unconditionally forgive his captors. He never had night terrors, post-traumatic stress disorder. His children didn't have, um, you know, uh, uh, stress because of, you know, it's intergenerational trauma and you can give it to your children. If you're traumatized and you have, you can't deal with it. You, you pass that trauma onto your children. 
And so he yeah. never had any of that. But the, now, before you go on, there were some points, there were reasons why he was the way that he was. First, he saw the cup as half full. Mm -hmm. So no matter what he went through, no matter how difficult things were, he could see the positive side of it. And for a POW, that says much, you know, and it, that kind of reminds me of Don McCain, because mm -hmm. he kind of had that same spirit about him. Um, John McCain was you in talk Vietnam. Vietnam. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 And so, um, so the being optimistic in the midst of your trauma that takes courage. That takes a lot of work. But then, on top of that, having that forgiving spirit, mm -hmm. having that forgiving spirit, he let it go. He forgave and he let go. That's why he didn't suffer from PST, you know, post traumatic stress. You know, that's why it did not become a generational thing for him and his family because he was able to forgive. He was able to see the cup is half full, even when everything around them was empty. <laughs> and so yeah. those oh, are, sure. people, those are, you know, and so those are some lessons that can be takeaways from that experience. Now, is there going to be a movie regarding what it is that you do, the work that you're doing? Oh, not, not. I did do some research for Hanks's uh, Playtown, but I won't be in anything yet. You know, I, you know, there won't be any, my name won't be anywhere, but I did spend a month um, or two months um, giving them stories and stuff like that. So no, not at this point, but I, I spent uh, 12 days at a, um, an artist colony called U Cross Foundation. It's um, 35 miles east of us. They feed you. Oh my God. We had five and six, seven course meals every night. We had the most wonderful lunches. The only thing we had to do was to um, <laughs> find our own breakfast. We had to go get granola and bananas and do it ourselves, which was, you know, how hard is that? And then we'd go to our sure. studios and there were 10 of us and we would work. And at night we all got together for dinner. And I mean, just the lunches, we didn't have sandwiches all the day, all the time. She'd have all these great food and I gained six pounds. It was so good. But I, I had the time and the space and the just no one needed me. And, and you know, I was so, and, and they paid me to be there. They didn't care if I got anything done. They just wanted me to be there. So it was just a really incredible experience. And I learned so much. And my goal was 33,000 words in, in 12 days. And I only made 32,601 words. So I figure I made my goal. So I'm not, I didn't chastise myself at all for that. But I will have a book sometime sooner than I hope probably by the end of next year. Cause you know, I'm back home and I have kids and I have grandkids and there's people that need me. Yeah. And so I, sometimes I, my yeah. work takes second, you know, second fiddle for everybody, but it, it'll get right. there. But the fact that you were at a retreat and you were able to at least get it started. Oh, and yeah. with you having these stories already in your head, you can actually record your book. You know yeah, what I'm probably. saying? Dictate it. Dictate it. You know, yeah, dictate it. And, it, and it's done. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm working on a guy's story. It would be done. Yeah. I, I'm working on a guy's story. He, his name was Leland Carpy. And I was at a POW reunion and I went out with some family friends, my uncle's best friend, the guy that got me into all of this. And we went out, he and his wife, we went out to dinner and this guy and his wife were sitting on the chair waiting for a, a a table. So we invited him to come with us because they had their tags on from the reunion. So Hal says, uh, so to Lee Kasner or Ed Kasner, he says, so uh, what bomb group were you with? And he says, the 95th, so was I. What day were you shot down? 14 August, 1940. So was I. He says, who was your co-pilot? And he says, Lee Carpy and Hal and Marie are looking like this because Lee was Hal's best friend and he was killed that day. So I decided I would learn what happened to him. And I want to write a whole book about him because he, there were two planes that went down close to each other. They got a mixed up. His family got a, a, a letter from the adjutant general who said, that said, 
your son, Lee Carpy, had an inseam of 32 inches and was buried at Remsdorf Cemetery. Well, he couldn't have been their son. He was six foot four and a half inches tall. He didn't have a 32 inch inseam. So then it was like, is he in a hospital? Is he dead? Is he alive? And it took three years after the war that the couple separated. His his wife went with the mother up north uh, in Northern California and his father stayed with the youngest son and the youngest son never saw his mother again. She died before she learned that before the family learned that he was finally buried as himself. But I want him to represent all the gold star families because we haven't ever given up on war. We're still right in the thick of all of it, you know, and we don't understand unless we have experienced that kind of loss and then to have all those things, they buried him, unburied him, buried him, unburied him. I mean, it was three times they put him in cold storage so they could use dental records. And finally, they got it right. And there was another guy buried in his place, and his name was Kenneth Lowing. So I'm researching him as well. And there were two crews, but they were all, there were a lot killed that day. And, and I, for some reason, I just, so I, I I found his his brother's executor to his will. And he uh, has given me permission. I have a contract with him that I can, in fact, write a book about him or take three years with whatever I want to do with him and tell his story because we don't understand how complicated, how sad, how much it takes out of us when, I mean, I never would want to lose my son or my daughter or my grandchildren. It just, it, it, it's horrendous for anybody. We all bleed the same way, don't we? Yeah, we do. And, and, we grief do. Is grief. and, and grief is grief. And you know what? Um, oh my God. I can't believe you know you've talked, <laughs> you've taken, you've talked most of this show, which is great. You know, <laughs> which is great because you have so many great stories and so much to share. But I do want to ask my audience to please support the Vera Thomas show. And you can do that by and I'm having problems. I'm afraid to even click on anything right now, but you can do that by going to Cash App, dollar sign in so great, or Venmo at VT1117. You can support, and I am excited because I just found out I am on 21 podcast platforms. 21 podcast That's platforms. Awesome. That's so awesome. I am I am so excited about this. So you please support my my efforts and what it is that I'm doing here. We had some glitches tonight, you know, but technology is technology. And when you're going live, you expect anything. And which yeah. is exactly what happened. And please subscribe, subscribe to this channel, The Vera Thomas Show. And here on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, subscribe, like, comment, please please. That will help me so much. And you can send a review at any one of the podcast platforms that I'm on. If you go to bit.ly forward slash Vera Thomas, if you go there, the very first link is the link that will show you all the different podcasts and shows that I'm on. And you can choose to uh, review on any one of them. So please, I need a review. I need a review. We've got a comment coming in. Uh, let's see. I'm afraid to even touch anything because I keep losing stuff. Okay. Okay. She says, Nancy says, so wonderful. Thank you, Nancy, for sticking around and listening. Val is amazing <laughs> with her storytelling. Absolutely. You, I understand you going into the schools and, and into different organizations, going into prisons. And, you know, going into prisons and talking to those who are incarcerated, these stories will give them a sense of hope. These stories will give them a sense of knowing, well, if they went through all this, no I, I matter work. what I've been through, I can too. Mm -hmm. There was, there was a group of young men and uh, this one kid never wanted to go home again because he got straight in. It was jail, but it wasn't like it was a boys school. And he said to me, I'm going to join the military. And I said, now, you know, you saw some of this, you know, because I use a video or a, 
a, a slideshow that they can see their men and see, you know, photographs of what happened to them. And he said, it's better. I can find home there. I can find my friends. I can find. So he went, I don't know what happened to him, but we, that day we, we worked for three days together and then um, they got to draw and they don't get to do much of that in, in the boys school. And some of the, the photo or the images were just, oh my gosh, it showed you what they went through. And uh, I was just grateful that I could be a part of their life. But now it's getting, it's, it's a little bit tougher to go in because it's hard. They're, they're, the kids are a little bit tougher to deal with. They are, but you know what? They need to hear these stories. They do. They need to hear these stories and understand what young people need to understand and what we as adults need to understand is our past does not define our future. However, our past gives us hope gives us strength, gives us resilience, gives us fortitude, helps us to understand this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. and you know, so, okay, go ahead. I'm going to tell no, something. Go ahead, You're done. go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I, was, I was writing about gratitude and I found um, a link to something and I got down a rabbit hole, but it said, if you can find gratitude every day of your life. If it's making your bed and it makes you feel good, find that gratitude. And if you can find gratitude in things and you never have to deal with taking pills for depression, if yes. you can find, because once you have a little gratitude, then all of a sudden you find all these other reasons to have gratitude and it just, it builds on itself. And so if, if, if any wisdom I can give to any of you, and I don't always do it, believe me, but I really work hard like Len Robinson. Oh, and when, when I interviewed, I have to tell this story too really quick. I think we're almost done. We got to go. But but he was sitting on his chair and I looked at him and he kept looking younger and younger and younger. All of us. And he walked up to this house when I got there that in the earlier afternoon. And he was he was limping and he was he had his cane. And then he jumps out of the chair and he runs down the hall to get something to show me. And literally he turned into a young man in front of my face. And it was just insane. I thought, is this, am I, am I making this up? But what caused that? What caused it? It was telling his story. And I think allowing the pressure off because, you know, he probably hadn't told his story for a really long time, but just amazing. So that's another thing. Share your stories. <laughs> Don't don't bottle up all the things that you've gone through in your life. Yes. Don't bottle it up. Share your stories. It's a sense of release. It's cathartic. It will help heal you. Even if all you do is write them down, you can have a journal because when you write things down, you see them differently. You you write down because you, you don't want to, you know, overthink it. Just write it. And then you look at it and you go, oh, I didn't realize that. Or, oh, look at this piece. And I think we need to um, get introspective. And, and you do yes. that when you write it or you tell it, whatever it is. It yes. really does work. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. So before you leave, we brought, we've only got a couple of minutes. I had commercials that I needed to play, but I'm afraid to touch anything. <laughs> I'll be honest. I I'm afraid to touch anything. But again, like, share, comment. Please support my show. And I'm going to give Nancy, I keep wanting to call you Nancy because Nancy, I keep yes, saying her right name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask Val to just kind of give us some final words. And the last thing you'll hear is my promo. Everybody, tune in next, tune in on Thursday for my show. And Val, it's just been a pleasure having you here and you i mean your storytelling is phenomenal and it really is it's phenomenal and so i appreciate you being here you've got 30 seconds okay okay um, I think we need to pay attention to people who are older than us, to the little kids who are younger than us, because sometimes if you allow them to speak instead of shutting them down, they say the most profound things. And when you listen to it, you go, oh, that's something I can use for my life. Yes. Thank you, Vera. I so appreciate it. Thanks, Nancy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. And let me say, 
Again, have a great week and we'll see you on Thursday. God bless. And and um, Val, if you'll hold on. The Beer and Tommy Show. 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 Let's talk about it. Let's talk. Let's talk.